This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 31st, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. Also on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we talk about the numbers involved in resolving the budget and why 11 and 6 are the key numbers. Second, we discuss the evolution of the discussion around SJR 6, the governor's proposed constitutional amendment on the PFD, and what it's going to take to pass SJR 6 and constitutionalize the PFD. And third, we focus briefly on the new oil field announcement from Pantheon Resources. Big numbers, but it's all about the financing. And now, let's join Michael. We're in the special session area. What's uh, what's what's your take on what's going on? Let's start off. Well, this uh, this episode of the of the top three is going to be all about numbers. Uh, we're going to talk about the budget, and then we're going to talk about the PFD, and then we're going to talk about oil. And each one of them is going to be driven by numbers. And on the budget, the magic numbers are eleven and six uh, that people should keep in mind. There was an article in the Juno Empire. Uh, a few days ago that was talking about where they are on the budget. Neil Foster was quoted uh, a liberal as he's the chair of the, of the conference committee. Uh, appropriately, he was quoted liberally throughout the uh, article. Um, and this, this passage, I think, says everything. It says the budget bill includes both the state's operating and capital budgets and the permanent fund dividend. But Foster said committee members also want to include a vote to reverse a state accounting mechanism known as the sweep. The sweep empties several state accounts at the end of each fiscal year and requires a three-quarter vote in each body to reverse. And so the magic numbers of 11 and 6 uh, are, are the numbers that would, that will stop the, that would stop the sweep. The, those are the numbers that the, the power the minority has to uh, raise their hands and say, oh, no, we're not voting for the sweep, and, and, and the leverage they have to negotiate uh, in this process, 11 in the House uh, and six in the Senate. And I think they're going to need it because I, you were right uh, uh, in your opening when you were saying that, that the delay that, that's going on here with the conference committee is is on purpose. I mean, what the, the tension that's going to go on here is this. They're going to go deeper and deeper into June, they, unless they reach an early agreement. But they're going to go deeper and deeper into June, increasing the pressure from those who think they're going to get pink slips and those who think they're going to be at risk of uh, of not having paychecks uh, come come July first, put increasing pressure on that eleven and six to uh, to vote for whatever the conference committee uh, votes out, uh, and they will tie uh, the PFD to uh, the the CBR, right. so that if you if you vote to reject the sweep, you're going to be voting to reject the the, the, the PFD. Uh, or the reverse sweep. If you vote to re- reject the reverse sweep, you're going to be voting to, to reject the PFD. That's how they'll tie the vote. And the question here is going to come, is, are there 11 in the House or six in the Senate? doesn't need to be both. can be one or the other. Is there 11 in the House or six uh, in the Senate who will stand their ground and say, I'm not going to vote for the reverse sweep uh, until you get a PFD, until we get a budget that has – uh, 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 X amount of PFD, and the target is the twenty three hundred dollars that uh, that the Senate put in. And and will there be eleven and six who are able to stand up to the pressure that's going to come as they go deeper and deeper into June, uh, uh, trying to uh, push uh, uh, a, a lower number? Uh, you've got it exactly right, and those those are the key numbers. So you know, go through your go through your roster on the House side, 
go through your uh, roster on the Senate side, are there 11 and 6, 11 or 6, uh, that will stand up in either body and, uh, and hold out for, uh, uh, for a PFD? And, 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 and once you do that, let's assume they do that, and let's assume they put the pushback is hard enough, uh, then the question is going to be how are they going to fund the budget? And I think that's where we get back to the whole ARP discussion we've had. Are, are you going to are they going to use ARP funds to backfill the budget uh, and avoid having to go into the ERA? The tools are there to be able to do that with the ARP funds. The question is whether they're going to whether they're going to use those tools uh, or hold the ARP funds out for uh, for special interests for the other things that we've talked about in past programs. Last week we had Senate uh, President Peter Machicki on, and I talked about this leverage, this leverage of the uh, of the reverse sweep vote and everything else, and he said, no, 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 they should all just vote against it, and that, you know, then we can get to it later. I mean, uh, to me, I see it as a, as a lever to be able to try and hold the line, uh, and like you said, try and fight for that full dividend. I mean, this idea that we just keep kicking the can and now, oh, we'll pass the budget and then we'll get to the dividend down in August. Um, I mean, I think that that's problematic uh, because, again, you've removed any leverage that you may have with votes over the budget, uh, you know, on the PFD itself. And I, and I think that's I think that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, we've talked on past programs about this, about the, the first political lesson I ever learned which was which was being told, oh, we'll get to your issue. Just support me on this issue. I promise you, we'll get to your issue. Um, and, and 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 that lesson was hard learned uh, uh, because they never came back to my issue. Um, and so it's yeah, I, that leadership is obviously going to say that leadership who wants to get, you know, who wants to get a bill passed, who who those especially who are going to, you know, be affected by or wilt under or not want to go through the the uh, the, the fire that, that some will try to bring as we get closer to July 1st, of course they want to get out of there, and of course they want to pass the budget, and of course they don't want to worry about the PFD. But but this is, this is the point at which leverage. It's 11 in the House, 6 in the Senate. This is the point at which there is, is leverage to extract, um, uh, extract things. Now, in all honesty, there's a point at which the majority will just will just give up on the CBR and say, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna pass this without the CBR," and then you're back to the 21 plus 11. Can they get 21 plus 11, uh, 21 in the House and 11 in the Senate to to pass the bill? And so you've you've, you've got this tension between how far can you push them without them just you know giving up on the CBR? But that's that's going to be the game. I mean, I the, the, this occasional emergence when they go into the committee room and they agree on things that's 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 all part of the game of of sort of playing this out uh and trying to keep the pressure on and the question is you know do you have 11 in the house or six in the senate who are going to be able to stand up and say it's not our fault it's not our fault that the pink slips are going out or the pink slips might go out uh, uh, we're merely trying to hold up for the for the PFD. We're holding up for something that's important to mid, middle and lower income Alaska families. Something that's important to the Alaska economy. Uh, go talk to the majority about uh, about why they're pushing this. Why they aren't uh, agreeing to backfill ARP funds or do other things that can that can uh, put a budget together that doesn't have to touch the ERA and can still. Uh, pay the twenty three hundred dollars uh, PFD. Well, and this is like I said. I mean, this has become SOP. This has become standard operating procedure for the legislature. Delay, delay, delay. We're down to the last you know week or two or whatever, and now it's a crisis. And 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 when we when we you know lead by crisis. This is what we end up with. We end up with slipshod stuff. We end up with things being thrown into the budget. We, you know, do it for sake of of exigency and and emergency and everything else. And uh, and it's it's become. I mean, it's planned this way. I mean, this is really what it comes down to. It's planned this way, so that they could say, well, we were in, we were had to do it because we were out of time. We had to do it this way. This is why. And if we didn't vote for it, then the government would shut down, and that would be a crisis and, and everything else. And, and I, I'm just I can't I can't believe that. Yeah, well, that's I mean that's we're going to hear that we're going to hear that. You and I will be talking about that in two weeks. My my guess, we'll be talking about that in two weeks that we're that we're into the middle of June. There isn't a budget yet. Oh my God, you know the the the, the school teachers will be turning out in droves. The state employee 
employees will be turning out in droves. What are we going to do? We get to July one without a paycheck. We'll have we'll have articles in the in the ADN and in the Juno Empire about you know teachers who live. Uh, you live hand to mouth and, uh, you know, have five kids in the house. And, you know, what are they going to do when they get to July 1 and there's no and there's no paycheck? I that's I mean, it's 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 power politics. It's not. I mean, this is stuff Chenault did, too, in his in in his time, in his way, stuff that John Harris did when he right. was speaker. It's, right. It's, it's how the, it's how the game is played. But the question really is, I mean, we're, 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 we're now dealing with the PFD this year's PFD, at least. The question is, are there 11 in the House or six in the Senate who who will be able to withstand the pressure of 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 the pink slips uh, and who will hold up and say, no, this is uh, this is the number we're going to agree to. And as I said, are are they going to be able will they stay inside the tipping point of of uh, of the majority just giving up on uh, giving up on the reverse sweep and, and and moving on? So my question is, again, going back to, I mean, what happens, um, you know, what happens about the, if the reverse sweep doesn't happen? So, I mean, I, you know, again, because that was, I think, what Peter Machicki was advocating for last week. We'll just say everybody just vote against the reverse sweep then. So what happens then? A- and, uh, I mean, I, 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 that you know, that's my question. So if, if the 6 or the 11 stand strong, what do you foresee happening at that point? Well, uh, so – so the PFD may be smaller uh, if they give up on the if they give up on the reverse sweep, because all you need to pass a smaller PFD then is 21 plus 11. Uh, the PFD may be smaller, and what happens is uh, the PCE and the uh, 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 secondary the, the college uh, uh, scholarship fund uh, both both essentially endowments come back into the CBR. Uh, and are made part of the CBR, and potentially in future years could be spent out. There also, we also may face an issue about whether the ERA comes into the CBR, uh, because uh, there are some who believe that uh, the same principle that applies to the uh, the the PCE and the, the college education funds applies to the to the ERA, and the ERA may come back into the CBR. It's because not the it, end of the world. Because it's a designated fund, right? I mean, that's why. It's basically right. sweeping all designated funds back into the CBR. Right. There's a, there's a strong argument, I believe, that the ERA is different. Uh, but, the, you know, the, there, will be, there may be some who take that to court. We may find out differently. Uh, but they'll come back into the CBR. And then, the, and then the concern is that once it's in the CBR, even though they, they may put it in separate accounts and they may put you know, separate covers on it, uh, once it's in the CBR, then it's subject to being uh, 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 used in subsequent years uh, to cover subsequent years' deficits. It'll be part of the kick the can uh, down the road uh, approach. And if the ERA comes back, there's a there's a problem with the ERA coming back because it would come it would leave the the permanent fund corporation and come over to the Department of Revenue for investment. And the, the Permanent Fund Corporation has a lot better investment history than the, right. than the Department of Revenue does. So the returns on that portion uh, might suffer. So it's, there, there's a lot of different things that, uh, that, that happen. But, uh, you know, one consequence is that, uh, uh, that the Permanent Fund might be smaller. I mean, it, because then you only need 21 plus 11 to be able to, uh, to pass the Permanent Fund, and there might be uh, support for – the, the, the minority loses the leverage it has, and the support for the uh, uh, in the majority for a lower permanent fund might be sufficient to uh, to pass it. Now, the 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 only thing about going into the CBR is that it then does require a three quarters vote to be able to draw that money back out of the CBR if the sweep uh, if the sweep does fail or the reverse sweep rather does fail then uh, then th- then that money remains in the CBR and it requires a three quarter vote. Not that they haven't had success in getting that threshold obviously they spent out you know a dozen billion dollars out of that fund without much problem but it does put a little bit of a higher hurdle on it so there may be some some positive on that side as well it it could be uh, uh could be but we've had a history of of using up the we've had a long history of using up the cbr uh to cover to cover deficits and not really you know worrying about that uh, uh, much from year to year, so I think there would be. I know. I know Lyman uh, Senator Hoffman has a lot of concern about the PCE coming back into the CBR, that it will never get redesignated. It'll never get set up separately again, 
and and all of this work year after year after year of putting money into the into the PCE to build up that fund and and protect the PCE uh, will have been undone. And I and I and I know he has concerns about that. I guess my main concern, Brad, going into putting the the you know putting all the reverse sweep money and even potentially the ERA in there. Is that again? Um, it uh, you know it 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 shortens the dividend for sure. Uh, it definitely makes the earnings reserve less viable as an investment tool if that money moves off of the permanent funds books. Um, and but I mean, is there any upside to it that you see? I mean, other than um, you know taking some of this out of the immediacy of just the tyranny of the majority, so to speak, is there anything else that pulls it out? The, the the upside, I guess, is the, the the one upside I can I can that strikes me is the two thirds vote that, that we were discussing on the on the program. But I don't I, I I don't see that much as an upside because I think you know once it's in the CBR, once it's no longer in the permanent fund, once it's in the CBR, I think the the inclination will be to spend it down and to continue on uh, this this uh, kicking the, the 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 effort to kick the can down the road. Um, and I think that's a uh, you know, it'll make it a little bit more difficult. The three quarters vote will make it more difficult to uh, uh, to do that. But I, we've blown through that the last decade, and I don't really see that as a showstopper. Potentially risking taking the ERA money out of the permanent fund, out of out of the permanent fund corporation, out of the permanent fund corporation's hands. I think that's a that's a not insignificant risk. Um, Treasury or the Department of Revenue is not really set up to make long-term investments in the same way the permanent fund corporation is they don't have the same time horizon they're they're more adept at managing money as opposed to investing money um, uh, making sure that, that that funds are available uh, when needed on the revenue side so I think there's I think that's a that's a that's another downside I see people in the chat room uh, uh, well people I guess uh, Harold mostly talking about how we're normalizing the idea of taxation. Um, look, I don't think that w- I don't think if we were fiscally responsible, we'd need taxation in this state. The problem is, is that we don't have the political will to pull the government budget down to where it needs to be. So what's going to happen is they're either going to I mean, first of all, we've already got taxation in the form of a PFD uh, taking. So there's that. I said, but on top of that, there is no political will to fix it any other way. So what alternative do we have other than to you know, move this taxation off of just the PFD and affecting the lowest, you know, 40 percent of income earners the hardest to, you know, to basically equalize that across a larger spectrum, whether it's through sales tax or a flat tax or whatever it is that we decide, we're already facing those taxes. Yeah, you we'll we'll talk about this more in the next segment, but we we've already normalized taxes. I don't <laughs> we've we've had taxes the last five years. That's what PFD cuts are taxes on the middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, we've normalized it, and 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 that's we're, there there is no way of balancing the budget without some form of revenue. Uh, we we've we've reached the point where you can't get a consensus. You can't get twenty one plus eleven uh, to to cut the budget. Uh, anymore, uh, the governor's recognized that the governor's given up on cutting the budget. Heck, his, you know, the, <laughs> we probably ought to do this in the next segment also. But, but the governor's spring ten-year uh, forecast, um, his spending level for FY22 is six percent above where his spending level was in the ten-year forecast he released last December. So, not only. Not only has the governor given up on cutting spending, his forecasts are saying that he's given up even on holding flat <laughs> to where to where he was suggesting we would be uh, in the in the in the fall uh, fall ten year forecast. So, yeah, there's we, we we have already normalized normalized taxes. It's just now a question of what form of tax we use. Do we use uh, a, a wholly inequitable uh, form that has the largest adverse impact on, on on middle and lower income Alaska families and on the overall Alaska economy. Do we use that form, or do we use something that is broader based and less has a lower adverse impact on Alaska families and uh, and the Alaska economy? That that's the question. It's not a question of if; it's a question of what type. But see, this seems to be the argument. I mean, Natasha von Imhoff is quoted in the ADN as saying, "Some lawmakers." Do not support paying a dividend that requires any taxes at this point. That's what I think. But again, 
you're already, ta- you know, if you're cutting into the dividend, you're already taxing Alaskans. Whether you call it a confiscation or whether you call it a tax, it is essentially, in essence, a tax on Alaskans' income. And so they're already taxing it. Yeah. Senator Hoffman called her out on that and said that's just a question of framing. I mean, she's framing it in a way that works for the top 20%, right? I mean, oh, my God, yeah, we can take the PFD. Don't worry about the PFD. That's not really taxation. We're really worried about taxation. Well, taxation would reach would reach the top 20%. What she's really trying to do is frame the argument in a way so that the top 20% can continue to uh, to get free goods and services out of government uh, without having to pay it with, by, by being able to push the costs off on middle- and lower-income Alaska families. We're continuing with Brad Keithley now, the weekly top three. Rhino number two, which is the PFD. We've been kind of skirting around the issue during the break here with Brad, talking about various aspects of it. Uh, and the big question, of course, is, you know, this framing issue of, well, should we have a PFD if it causes us to tax each other? You know, we shouldn't have a PFD if it's going to cause us to have to. We already have to. The taking of the PFD is the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and on the uh, on the economy as a whole. It is a tax. Now, whether you call it a tax or a confiscation or whatever, but it has the effect of a taxation, especially on those who are in the lowest 50 percentile of the income. They feel it more than anybody else. And uh, so we already have those taxes. But let's talk about the PFD, Brad. What 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 is your take on where it goes from here? Well, there's a great article by James Brooks uh, in, uh, in, the, in the ADN, the Anchorage Daily News, uh, over the weekend. Really does a deep dive, a thorough dive. I have one little uh, uh, critique of it, but it does a, a, a pretty good dive uh, into, uh, into the PFD and where the PFD is. And I think the, 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 the one paragraph that sort of captures the, the issue uh, is this one. Uh, Leading lawmakers, including prominent Republicans, say the governor's proposal has merit, but because it creates large deficits for at least a few years, it needs to be accompanied by new taxes. That would require a major shift in policy by Dunleavy. Since his election in 2018, the governor has insisted on no new taxes without a statewide vote. Senate Majority Leader Shelley Hughes, Republican Palmer, said the 50-50 proposal is a great first step, but Dunleavy needs to act, uh, referring uh, referring to the need for uh, taxes or revenues to uh, to fill the gap. It, it as we were saying during the break, we there is no question we have revenue shortfalls. There's no question we have, and we're going to continue to have uh, deficits going forward. Uh, the governor has basically given up on on cutting, cutting, indeed maybe even controlling spending. As I said during the break, the uh, the ten year forecast that the governor put together. Uh, in the fall, in, in his December budget uh, forecast, uh, that he was going to keep spending, FY22 spending, at a certain level. Five months later, the, the, the spring forecast that he's rolling out now, the new 10-year forecast that he's rolling out now uh, to support uh, SJR6, uh, has FY22 spending 6% higher than, uh, than what he uh, than what he forecast uh, 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 in December. So there, there is there is no appetite uh, uh, either in the legislature, uh, broadly speaking, or in the governor's office uh, for making the spending cuts necessary to avoid any form of taxation. So the question is this: We've got uh, we're going to have a deficit. What's the way to to fill? What's the best way to fill that deficit? Using PFD cuts to fill that deficit. Uh, has the largest adverse impact on uh, middle and lower income Alaska families, 80% of Alaska families, um, and has the largest adverse impact of any of the options uh, on the overall Alaska economy. There are better ways to do it. And and I think what, what people are confronting uh, is something that we've talked about on the show before, which is before people give up their hands on the PFD, before they allow the PFD to be constitutionalized, uh, and take it out of the legislature's hands, which is what constitutionalizing it would do, before before the legislature gives up gives up to its control over the PFD, its ability to use that as revenue to fill these deficits. They want to see what what other form of of, of revenue filler uh, is is going to come out of that. So it's it's we've gotten to the point where I think people are. Uh, generally supportive of constitutionalizing the PFD, but recognizing that we have these long-term deficits 
I, I, I take issue with those who would characterize it as short term. Recognize that we have these long term deficits. Um, uh, the question is, you know, what are we going to use as a revenue pillar? And now, and now the debate needs to move, and I think it is moving toward what revenue filler, what revenue approach are we going to use to uh, to fill the deficits going forward? That question has become part of the PFD issue and needs to be answered before we get to constitutionalizing the PFD. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. This, I mean, this fight is, you know, uh, is been going on constantly over the last, you know, five, six, seven years, this fight over the PFD. It has become the central focus of almost every session since then. And one of the reasons why, obviously, constitutionalizing the PFD is important is that it takes that it takes that out of their hands. And then they may have to face the hard reality of, well, here's it. You can't draw from this pot of money anymore. You can't use it as your slush fund or your piggy bank. And you now have to face the fact that these deficits, be they long term or short term, um, these deficits are there. They're real. And you have to face the fact that, you know, you're either going to have to cut deeper into the budget or you're going to have to, you know, provide, you know, show to Alaskans why they need to pay a specific tax for it. And I think that's what they've been avoiding this whole time. It is. And, and the PFD has been a convenient way to do it because it's sort of a backdoor tax, right? They, they don't have to they, – they can avoid saying they're taxing uh, because they can just cut it out of the appropriations. It's sort of the British way of taxing, actually, to do it in, in each budget cycle. Um, and they can – you know, and, and so it's sort of been their backdoor way of avoiding, avoiding it. Well, obviously, it's eliminated <laughs> – We've gotten to the point where we're eliminating the, the PFD. I mean, the, the, the leftover PFD isn't even $500. People are saying it's $500. But if you don't use the ARP funds to backfill a portion of the, re- a portion of the, uh, a portion of the revenue, it's not even $500. So we've gotten to the point where the PFD is about to go away. And, and, and that, I think, has triggered pushback and, and saying, no, we need to constitutionalize the PFD. But then you have to address you know, what kind of what kind of revenues you're, you're going to have. This is it isn't a question of and and, and, and Michael, I, I know this is you know, I know this is not going to be fun in the chat room, but this is not a question of may have to adopt new revenue measures. We will have to adopt new rev, revenue measures. There is not the will in the legislature the way we're going now and in the governor's office. There's not the will to make the spending cuts. Uh, the deep spending cuts that would be necessary to get us uh, down to uh, 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 a level that that could be filled by traditional by traditional revenues, uh, traditional revenues plus uh, plus 50 percent of the of the POMB draw. So it's we we are confronting this, and and the question is, are we going to continue to use the PFD, the the approach that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and the Alaska economy to fill those deficits? Or are we going to come up with a better, uh, more equitable, lower impact uh, uh, revenue approach that uh, that 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 positions positions us to meet these revenue shortfalls in the future, and or these deficits in the future? And and I'll add one thing that we've talked about on the show before: it the 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 upside, if there is, of of these other revenue measures, is that they would engage more Alaskans. Uh, particularly the top 20 percent, particularly the donor class, particularly the class that uh, that uh, the legislature listens to mo- most, it would engage that class, that bracket, in pushing back on spending. Uh, and frankly, I think one of the reasons you find Democrats uh, sort of you know silently uh, uh, agreeing to continue PFD cuts is they don't want to engage that top 20 percent because they know the consequence of that. Will be will be pressure on to reduce spending. So, I you, we've got a lot of issues coming up, but, right. but it's boiled down to: Are we going to use the PFD, or are we going to use uh, 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 other revenue measures? Uh, been brought up a couple times here by a couple different people, but and I agree in part that uh, part of the solution is going to be upping the take uh, from the oil industry. And I know that uh, Mike Shower slides. Uh, that we talked about uh, last week, I think maybe we, maybe it was the week. I guess it was last week. Uh, you know, it utilizes that as a portion of this that there will be new revenues, but there'll also be a adjustment to the uh, oil taxation. Uh, that there's more to be left on the table there as well, and that's part of the solution, Brad. Right? I mean, as we look forward on this, part of that solution has to come uh, from from the industry as well. 
I agree, but we're a billion and a half short. Uh, uh, the deficit is a billion and a half. And so the question is, a billion and a half or more, depending upon the year. And so the question, the question is, uh, yes, oil is part of the solution. Mike Shower talks about 200 million. Maybe there's a year. Maybe there's a little bit more. Maybe there's a little bit less. They are part of the solution. But that's not – that's far from being the only solution. Uh, and there is a substantial gap remaining uh, beyond uh, beyond just uh, changing oil. Even if you did – even if at the extreme you took Bill Wilikowski's approach and wiped out all of – the uh, what are called the oil credits, which are really reductions in tax rate. Uh, even if you wiped out that, that's just a billion dollars. That still doesn't get uh, the the deficit closed. So there there is going. I mean, we need to have we need to have this debate about what individual tax uh, 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 Alaskans are going to are going to bear uh, in order to close the deficit. Is it going to be through PFD cuts that shoves it to middle and lower income Alaska families, or is it going to be something more equitable, more broad based? You talk about number three, your new talk about number three is uh, new oil, including uh, the new uh, find along the Dalton Highway. You want to touch on that quickly here with us? Yeah, it's um, so there's an article in the Alaska Journal of Commerce that talks about uh, an announcement by uh, uh, the successors to Great Bear, uh, a lot of people may remember Great Bear, uh, who was, you know, exploring south of the, south of the, north of the Brooks Range, but south of the traditional oil fields. Um, and there was an announcement last week that by Pantheon Resor- Resources, which is the successor, that they may have found uh, roughly 1.4 billion barrels of recoverable uh, oil uh, in this play. To put that in context, uh, Willow, the big, you know, Conco's big willow prospect is only 590 barrels, uh, million barrels of, of recoverable oil. So we're talking about something that would be close to uh, doubling, close to double in size. But it's, it's all about numbers. Are they got, is there going to be oil price, uh, oil demand and oil price uh, that justifies someone coming in and making the investment necessary uh, to, uh, to develop that field? And given what else is going on in the energy industry and the oil industry and, and, and demand, while it looks like short-term demand is spiking, it looks like long, medium and long-term demand, which is when this field would ultimately come on if somebody invested in it, that that demand is, is declining, uh, and it looks like price is declining along with it. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of – there should be a lot of skepticism uh, about not the geologic numbers – uh, but about uh, the likelihood of achieving the investments necessary to uh, to develop this field. Again, it's all about the numbers. Do we, are the numbers there to be able to support final investment decision FID? Uh, and uh, and and the article the article doesn't touch on that at all. Uh, it just talks about the geologic numbers and creates a lot of excitement. Shelly Hughes was talking about it. Uh, during a committee meeting uh, last week. But what we ought to be talking about is can we get this stuff financed and is it realistic to think it's going to be financed? Uh, (laughs) And, of course, we've talked about that, including the reticence of some of the big uh, financial institutions now to touch Alaskans' uh, oil infrastructure and everything else. So it could be a a, a tough road to hoe in the future. Yeah, there's not not a lot of good signs out there that new resources – I mean, IEA – International Energy Agency came out last week and said, we don't, if we're going to achieve uh, 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 net zero, net zero emissions by 2050, which is the Paris goal, if we're going to achieve that, uh, we, we, we should not develop any new oil and gas fields from here on out. We should just ride down what we've got, that we've got enough to get us to, get us to, 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 to 2050, and, and, and at that point we've converted over to renewables. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of things that that are occurring in the energy world, energy finance world, that that tells uh, in potential investors to be cautious about investing in oil, and to look elsewhere in re, in, in renewables, for example, for uh, for new investments. So it's it's not just Alaska that's challenged, but but Alaska is very challenged in uh, in in finding uh, 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 the numbers, finding uh, investment dollars to support. Uh, support these these types of developments heck 
uh, uh, Pantheon doesn't even have doesn't even have financing right now. In the article, they said they don't even have financing for next year's uh, exploration program to continue to 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 define these reserves. So you know, thinking that they're going to get to long term FID on this, that they're going to find enough financing to, to go to long term development on this is is um, uh, very uh, very stretched thinking. Let's try to put it. Let's put it that way. Uh, Brad, uh, 40 seconds, uh, last final thoughts. What do people do? Marching orders, how can they help? I, if it were me, and, it, and, and I will be supporting the 11 in the House and the 6 in the Senate on, uh, on holding out on, uh, uh, on the uh, reverse sweep and, uh, and using that as leverage to uh, get what they can out of this year's PFD. Well, that's what we got to do. Hopefully those folks can hold the line. Hopefully we have the... The steady 11. I mean, we thought we had 19, but, uh, you know, the steady 11 anyway in the House. And we know we've got six probably in the Senate, so we'll continue that. Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. As always, it's a good discussion. We appreciate you being part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.